We just talked about how if a monopolist lived in his dream world, he'd be able to figure out exactly how much everyone would be willing to pay for a good and charge them that price. In reality, this is impossible, but firms still try to do some price discrimination. How do they do it? There are many examples of price discrimination in the real world. Some of them you encounter every day, but may not realize are a result of price discrimination. Others are just crazy. Let's start with the ones you may see in your day-to-day -day life. Consider buying an airline ticket from Boston to San Francisco. If I try to get tickets for a year from now, the best price is about $400. But if I try to get tickets for today, the best price is around $700. That's a huge difference. This gap is because of price discrimination. If you're the type of customer who's looking for last minute airfare across the country, it's probably because something important came up and you have to go. As a result, you're more likely to have a high willingness to pay, hence the higher price. But if you're planning a trip one year out, you're not going for an emergency. You're probably just planning a vacation and maybe willing to switch cities or dates of travel if the price is too high. A small example is for books. When the seventh Harry Potter book first came out, the price was about $35. This is because Harry Potter fans were desperate to find out how the series ended. Even with the relatively high price, 8.3 million copies were sold in the United States within 24 hours of its release. My family bought three of these. About a year later, the paperback version of the book came out and it only cost $16.95. The price got cut in half. Why? Part of it may be that a hardcover is nicer or more expensive to produce, but the difference in production costs is small. The real reason for the price drop was price discrimination. There were many hardcore Harry Potter fans, like my family. These were the people at the left end of the demand curve with a desperately high willingness to pay. They want the book today at almost any cost. But there are also a lot of people who were interested in the series but had no trouble waiting. The publisher wanted to target those groups separately. Therefore, charged a high price at first because those were the more desperate readers and a low price later because they were the more patient buyers. Another example you may have encountered is Disney World in Florida. A two-day pass to Disney World costs about $200, but for locals, the price is discounted by 50%. Why? Well, imagine you don't live near Disney World. For most families, Disney World is a big experience. Kids are desperate to go, and the average family might only go once in a lifetime. They see it as an important special vacation and are willing to pay a lot for airfare and hotels. Once they've paid that, these families are unlikely to cancel a trip because the entry fee is $10 or $20 higher. Their demand is inelastic. But for locals, it's different. They've probably been many times already in their life, since it's so close and requires no airfare or hotel expenses. Their demand is likely to be elastic and therefore more price sensitive. So Disney World charges two different prices because they can make a good guess about your willingness to pay based on how far you've traveled. I'll finish with one especially crazy example. In 1990, IBM started selling two types of laser printers. The first was the laser writer, which cost $2,395. Printers used to be really expensive. Mostly only businesses would want these high-end printers. Consumers wouldn't just buy one for their home. As a result, IBM started selling the laser writer E for $1,495, aimed for home use. This is where it gets goofy. A technology magazine took apart both printers to figure out what the difference was. It turns out they used the exact same materials. Everything about the printers was identical, with one exception. The cheaper printer, the Laser Writer E, had four small pieces of firmware attached that slowed the printer down. They built the exact same printer, then spent some money to slow it down and sold it for $1,000 less. This sounds crazy, but it makes sense if you think about price discrimination. For a person or company who prints all the time and cares a lot about performance, they may be willing to pay a lot for a top-of-the-line printer. But the average person may not be so impatient. They may care less about speed and more about cost. But IBM couldn't just sell the same printer at two different prices. If they tried to sell for the lower price, then all the businessmen that were buying the high price printers would pay the low price instead. This is the classic poisoning effect. So instead, they created a product that was unappealing to businesses as a way of differentiating. IBM's solution was a classic attempt at price discrimination. As more and more sales happen over the internet, price discrimination may be getting easier. 
Think about Amazon.com. They have millions of shoppers and they can track which website each shopper accesses. They can tell if you're looking at only high-end products. They know when your birthday's coming up. So they likely have enough data to estimate your willingness to pay for certain goods, at least to some extent. In fact, in the early 2000s, some customers noticed they were offered a higher price when they accessed Amazon.com on their home computers, but a different price when they accessed it from a different computer. This was because Amazon.com had information on you when you accessed them from your home computer, which they could use to tailor the price to your willingness to pay. People were outraged, and Amazon stopped immediately, promising never to price discriminate based on user data. What's the takeaway? Price discrimination is common if you know where to look.